You are the light, you are the fight within my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. I will sing into the night. Christ is risen and on high. Greater is he living in me than in the world. No surrender, no retreat. We are free and we're redeemed. We will declare over despair you are the hope. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord. Our God, our conqueror, nothing is impossible, every chain is breakable with you, we are victorious, you are stronger than our hearts, you are greater than the dark with you, we are victorious. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Our Lord, our God, our is always fair. I really enjoy repeating myself over and over again. I just love when the kids talk back to me. I don't care if you get a job this summer. I don't care if you get detention. Uh, I, I can't open this jar. See if mom can open it. Just take your time in there, okay? No means maybe. Hey, why don't you bring that ball inside and play with it? Hey, don't put that back where you found it. Just leave it on the floor. Ew, bacon. If you put a dent in the car, it's really no big deal. It's 10 a.m. Go back to bed. Look, whatever your friends are doing, just do the exact same thing. I got more than enough sleep last night. If your friends are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. Stop signs are just a suggestion. You don't need a chaperone. You don't need a seatbelt. You don't need a savings account. You should buy the jeans with the holes in them. Hey, we're all gonna go to church, but you can just sleep in, okay? Can we please just hang out in here for another 10 minutes? Hey, can we get some more bickering back there? All right, bills! Yay, traffic! Woohoo, taxes! Yes! Laundry! Hey, can you kids come in here and jump on my bed? Quick, go tell mom what happened right away. You don't need to finish your dinner. Hey, look at your phone when I'm talking to you. I wish I had a smaller TV. We got you that phone for a reason, texting boys. All right, everyone, listen up. Mom and I are going out of town this weekend, so please, mess up the whole house while we're gone. Please throw a few parties while we're gone. Please forget about the dog entirely while we're gone. Hey, when you're finished pouring that, can you just leave it out on the counter all day? Thanks. Hey, what are you doing? I'm gonna bungee jump out of this tree. That's a really good idea. <laughs> I really like that guy. He's hilarious. Hey, welcome to Twickenham. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to you guys. And uh, we're glad you're here. If you are a guest, and I've met quite a few already this morning, thanks for stopping by. We're really glad to have you. If you're traveling, we'll pray for traveling mercies for you. If you're here visiting relatives, we'll pray that that goes quickly. If you are in town, uh, from town, and you're looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. Just really glad you're here. There is a, a card on the seat right in front of you. You can fill that out and put it in the collection plate when it passes a little later in our service. 
And if you have a prayer request, indicate that on the card, and we'll be praying about those first thing in the morning. We're just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. This morning, Art Leslie is going to be reading uh, some scriptures as we go along, and you will notice that we are singing some more manly songs this morning in honor of Father's Day. So they're all kind of marchy songs. So why don't we all stand, and let's get ready to enjoy our time with each other and with the Lord. Thanks for being here. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished and Christ is born. So now, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith in his promises, we can have real peace with him because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. For because of our faith, he has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to actually becoming all that God has has had in mind for us to be. Right, oh, men of God have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O oh, men of God, His kingdom can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they are good for us they help us to learn to be patient and patience develops strength of character in us and helps us trust God more each time we use it until finally our hope and faith are strong and steady then when that happens we're able to hold our heads high no matter what happens, and know that all is well. For we know how dearly God loves us, and we feel this warm love everywhere within us because God has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. There is no greater truth than this. There is no stronger love we know. God himself comes down to live.
when we were utterly helpless with no way of escape, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners who had no use for him. Even if we were good, we, we really wouldn't expect anyone to die for us, though, of course, that might be barely possible. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Would you be seated as we take our offering? Who is this King of glory, beautiful and matchless one? Who is this King so holy, every knee shall bow at his throne? Jesus, the Lamb of God, say. Since by his blood he did all this for us as sinners, how much more will he do for us now that he has declared us not guilty? Now he will save us from all of God's wrath to come. And since when we were his enemies, we were brought back to God by the death of his son, what blessings he must have for us now that we are his friends. And he is living within us. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Be still my soul, redeeming love. Out of the dust of Calvary is rising to the throne of love. There is no Oh. 
Let's bless the breaking of the bread. Father, this Father's Day, as we celebrate this Father's Day, we give thanks to you, our Heavenly Father. We thank you for the sacrifice you made for sending your Son to die on the cross so that we may have a relationship with you and everlasting life. Lord, we just uh, pray for the bread that we're about to receive, which represents your body, and we thank you for all the blessings that you give us this day. We thank you for our families. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. When my accuser makes the claim that I should die for my offense, I point him to that rugged frame where I found life at Christ's expense. See from his hands, his feet, his side, the fountain flow. pray. Father, we thank you so much for your son Jesus, for the blood that was shed to cleanse us of our sins, that we may be presented holy in your presence, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and remember, Lord. We remember. And we thank you for all your blessings, Lord. Please bless this that we are about to receive that represents your blood. It's Christ's name we play. Amen.
Worthy is the Lamb, Lamb for sinners slain, Jesus, Lord of all, glory to his name. Heaven crying out, let the earth proclaim, power in the blood, glory to his name, Jesus. Oh, let my soul arise and sing, Let's stand. my confidence is not in Now, we rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done in dying for our sins, making us friends with God. Amen. So, later on in our service, we will have a special prayer for dads, and uh, Scott Martin will lead us in that prayer. And dads, you should know that we uh, will be making a contribution to His Way. His Way is uh, an addiction recovery program for men. And, and we're going to make a, a, a donation to His Way in honor of Twickenham Fathers as a way of acknowledging and honoring you by blessing the guys that are working really hard to become the men they want to be over at His Way. We appreciate their work. So if you've been in church um, for more than a year or two, and you don't, you don't have to have a, a lot of mileage in church to know this, but, but if you've been around a, a couple of years in churches, you know that on Mother's Day, the preacher uh, basically celebrates all the good things that are mom. And when I was a young preacher, my Mother's Day sermon was basically, moms are awesome, moms are a gift from God, give me an M. Give me an O, give me an M, yay mom. And now that I'm an old preacher, my Mother's Day sermons are exactly the same thing, all right? But the typical Father's Day sermon went something like, you guys are a sorry lot. No wonder the world is in such a mess. You're not doing your job. Shape up or God's going to really be mad at you. So years ago, uh, when I was very young, I, I preached a, a Father's Day sermon, and it was, I mean, it had some pepper on it, okay? It was pretty, pretty stout. And uh, I had this guy come up to me after, after the worship service, and he was visibly angry. He was shaking, which is a little unusual because he was not an angry guy. He was an accountant, and he never got angry about anything unless it didn't, didn't add up. He just was real kind of level. So he, he came up to me and he said, why is it that every year on Mother's Day, you put mothers on a pedestal, but on Father's Day, you knock us off the pedestal and then you pick it up and beat us to death with it? <laughs> he said, a lot of us guys are really trying out there more than you think. And then we come here and we feel like we just went 12 rounds with Muhammad Ali. So the next year... My sermon on Father's Day was, give me a D, give me an A, give me another D, yay dad. Uh, but the, the, the truth is the guy had a point. Um, I, I, I did, and I think a lot of preachers do, tend to be pretty tough on, on dads. This morning, we're going to wrap up our, our family series. We've, we've been in a series called, oh, Good and Messy. I started on Messy because I think that's the side I'm kind of more familiar with in my own life. Good and Messy. We've been talking about how family is just hard, and that if 
your family is messy, you're not a failure. And that good doesn't mean that you're perfect. So we've been kind of working through that, looking at some scriptures, and we're going to wrap it up this morning. We started this on Mother's Day. We're going to wrap it up today. And we're going to talk about how to be the kind of man it takes to lead a family through the messy toward the good, but we're not going to beat anybody up. In fact, I, I, I think all of us, my, my aim, my hope, my intent is for all of us, particularly dads, to be encouraged this morning. So we, we began this series in um, the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and that's where we're going to end the series. So we're going to take off and land pretty much in the same airport. Um, we'll be in Genesis chapter 6 this morning. And I just want to read the story and get it out there in front of you. You'll, uh, a lot of you will be very familiar with this, uh, others of us a little vaguely familiar, but I, I think it, it's going to be fairly well known to just about everybody. And if it's not well known, then you get to hear this cool story for the first time, and I almost envy you a little bit. So Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to begin in verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So, the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Get the impression that things are pretty corrupt. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you were to build it. And so the rest of that chapter kind of goes through all of the, the particular instructions for how to build the ark. And then you get down to verse 22, then Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. Now you probably remember how this story ends. God orders Noah to fill the ark with two of every kind of animal with seven of the ceremonially clean animals, and, and then it rains for 40 days and 40 nights, and Noah and his family spend a year in this floating zoo before the floodwaters recede and they can finally step out, on, step out on dry ground. That is some story, isn't it? Can we, can we just be honest about something here? This is Huntsville. We're kind of into science, so when we, we hear this story about a boat big enough to handle two of every kind of animal, plus eight people, and a worldwide flood, God actually wiping out everything he had made, it all sounds a little fictional. What, why should we take this, a story like that seriously? Besides... Isn't it true, and it is, that a lot of the ancient civilizations have flood stories too, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, there are half dozen other flood stories from ancient literature. And so for a lot of skeptics, they go, well, that just means that this whole Noah thing is either derivative or made up or whatever. I kind of come at that from a different place. If there are a bunch of ancient documents talking about some kind of cataclysmic flood that happened, if everybody's talking about it back in the day, isn't it a little arrogant for me or you or anybody else to go, well, it must not have happened? 
Aren't we being kind of chronologically snobbish to say that those folks way back when weren't on to something? In fact, to me, the fact that there's other accounts of some big cataclysmic event suggests it may have happened. Then there's this. We should take this story seriously because Jesus took it seriously. And I don't know about you, but we, we, kind of, we kind of think Jesus is a big deal. That's our whole thing, right? He took this story seriously. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 38 and 39, here's what Jesus said. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be, coming, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And that's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. We, we take this story seriously because he did. And then there's this. In the last week or so, has there come a point at which you closed your news feed on your phone or you turned off your TV or radio or put down your newspaper and just had this feeling that the world was an irrecoverable mess. Terror attacks, human trafficking, climate worries, feckless, incompetent leadership, and that's bipartisan, by the way. War, poverty, crime, violence, some nut job shoots up some congressman. Have, have you just read your, 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 your news headlines or, or, or walked away from the television set and gone, that ain't right, that just ain't right. Well, that's exactly how the world was then, except it was worse. Verse 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Every inclination, only evil all the time. Nobody back then said, that ain't right. Nobody back then said, this is a mess. Somebody needs to do something about this. Every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. That's got the ring of truth to it. And then God's response to the mess the world was in sounds truthful too. In fact, it sounds a lot like yours or mine. The Bible says that God was grieved. One version says that his heart was filled with pain. Another, that the state of the world grieved him to his heart. Still another translation says that God was heartbroken. A lot of folks think that, that God's only reaction to sin is anger, wrath. No. God has a much richer emotional vocabulary than that. He knows grief as well. In fact, this is the first time in the Bible that an emotion is attributed to God, and that emotion is sorrow. It is grief. So we take this story seriously because it tells the truth about the shape of the world, the shape the world was in, the shape it is in, and it was and is a mess. But there's this one guy, Noah. And at first he seems a little unreal too because verse 9, look at that, it says that he was righteous, he was blameless among the people of his time, and that he walked faithfully with God. Righteous, blameless, and he walked with God. Really? We'll come back to those three descriptors in a moment. First, I want you to get a real feel for who this guy was. Is that Noah was a man's man. He just was. To start with, he comes from a family that was either a lot or a little like yours. Good, messy. His father was named Lamech, and he has the distinction of being the first slam poet or rap artist in the history of the world. Genesis chapter 4, he composes this little poem for his two wives, his two wives, messy. Here's what he said, Ada and Zilhah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77, word. <laughs> Just kind of a rough guy. Noah's father, 
killed a man, as Johnny Cash sang, just to watch him die. But his great grand that's the messy part. His great grandfather was a guy named Enoch. Genesis 5 says that Enoch walked with God and then the Lord just took him. A lot of people think, I'm not sure I agree with this, but a lot of people think that Enoch was just such a good guy that God didn't even let him die. He just took him up to heaven. Maybe. But at any rate, some people in Noah's family were pretty rough around the edges, and some people were as godly as they come, good and messy. Kind of like a family most of us could relate to, I guess. And then there's Noah, the man himself. He was a husband, a father, a father-in-law. We know that he knew something about agriculture and farming because he plants a vineyard later on in the story, and because of the vineyard, his story gets a little messy. But then you start thinking about what it took to build that boat, and you realize that Noah had a raft of other gifts and abilities. For example, Noah had to have been a lumberjack. If you and I were ordered to build a large boat, the first place we'd go would be to Lowe's or Home Depot to buy wood, right? Noah didn't have a lumber yard. The nearest lumber yard to Noah was several thousand years away. If you or I had to cut our own wood, we'd use a chainsaw. Some of y'all don't know what a chainsaw is. It's an awesome, awesome tool. It's made of a chain attached to a motor run by a mix of gas and oil. It is one of the most manly things a man can do. Crank a chainsaw and use it. It's powerful, it's loud, it's terrifying. And Noah didn't have one. He lumberjacked the old-fashioned way. Handsaws and axes, which is probably why it took around a century to build the ark. If you and I had to nail thousands of planks onto a wooden frame, we would use a nail gun. A nail gun is a more awesome tool than a chainsaw. A nail gun has a trigger, a handle. It sounds like a gun with a suppressor. It has a cartridge. It either runs on compressed air or a combustible gas, which is just fun to say, like butane or propane. And when you, when you use one, when you use a nail gun, when a man uses a nail gun, he feels like Terminator with a tool belt. If you haven't gotten your father a Father's Day gift yet, Home Depot and Lowe's are open. You go buy him a nail gun. And you say, Jody, my dad doesn't really need a nail gun. You buy your daddy a nail gun, need will find your daddy. Those are awesome tools. Noah did not have a nail gun. He had a hammer. So Noah's a husband, father, father-in-law, a farmer, a lumberjack. He's an engineer. He's a carpenter. He's a zoologist. He's, he becomes a sailor. And then Peter even says he was a preacher. So dads, if you ever feel like all you do is change one hat for another all day long, like you have a dozen different roles to fill, you and Noah have something in common. If you come from a family that is a mix of good and messy, same with Noah, and if any of us are ever overwhelmed at the evil, corruption, and violence we see around us, welcome to Noah's world. Still, with, with all of those similarities between dads today and Noah then, between his family and ours, between our world and his, there was something unique about Noah. Remember those three descriptors. He was righteous, he was blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. What, what do those three things tell us about Noah? Well, to be righteous can mean a couple of different things. It, it could mean that he just lived right. That while the rest of the world was, and this is, this is how God described it, wicked, evil, corrupt, and violent. Those are the actual words. Noah was moral, good, pure, and peaceful. That's what righteous could mean. Or the word righteous could be less about how Noah lived and more about where he stood with God. In other words, it was less about what Noah did and didn't do and more about what God 
did. It wasn't so much that Noah lived right as it was that God had righted the relationship, that God had made things right. That's what righteous here could mean. The phrase, he was blameless among the people of his time, could mean a couple of different things too. It could mean that compared to everybody else, Noah was a saint, which is not really saying much. When every inclination of the human heart is only evil all the time, you can be a pretty rotten human being and still be better than everybody else. When the bar is that low, it's not all that hard to be best in show. Or to say that he was blameless among the people of his time could mean that despite all of the corruption around him, Noah had somehow managed not to be corrupted. And then it says he walked with God. In the Bible, to walk is a metaphor for how you live. Kind of like another Johnny Cash song, I Walk the Line. Noah and God were headed in the same direction. Noah's life was in step with God. Now right here is where a lot of sermons about Noah and a lot of Father's Day sermons go off the rails because it's really easy to get to this point in the story and conclude that Noah and his family were saved from destruction because he was righteous, blameless, and walked with God. And since you guys are not righteous, blameless, and walked with God, your bums and your families are going to be washed away in a tsunami of wickedness. But were Noah and his family saved because he was righteous, blameless, and walked with God? Because he was a good man? You have to look at this story in the context of all of the other stories and passages and teachings in Scripture. And there are a lot of places in the Bible where it says that no one is righteous in the sense of living perfectly right or blameless. Romans 3.23 is a famous one, all have sinned. Psalm 14.1, there is no one who does good. There are places in the Bible where where it it says that nobody stays perfectly in step with God. Psalm 14, 3, all have turned aside. No one walks the line perfectly. So was Noah really so good that God had no choice but to save him? Was Noah and his family saved because he was righteous and blameless and he walked with God? I mentioned earlier that this story is the first time an emotion is attributed to God. It says that God was grieved. There's another first in this passage, too. And it, too, is a response to sin. It's in verse 8. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The Hebrew word for favor means grace. This is the first time grace appears in the Bible. And Noah found it. God was grieved at what a mess the world had become, and God gave grace to Noah. It's not that Noah was good, it's that Noah was graced. And God's grace is what made him righteous, made him right with God. God's grace is what made Noah blameless, removed his guilt. God's grace is what enabled, empowered Noah to walk with God. See, I, what I think is that we look at people like Noah in Scripture and we sometimes we, we think, I, I can't do that. I think a lot of dads especially look at stories like this and we go, I can't live up to that. I got too much unrighteousness in my life. I am too blameworthy. I am not in step with God. I'm too big a mess to be righteous or blameless, much less try to keep up or keep in step with God. I'm just not that good. What we forget is that God is that good. The world is a mess. You're a mess. I'm a mess, but God is good. God 
is good at cleaning up messes. No matter how messy your life has become, our good God can make you righteous and blameless. And this is the, he can match your stride until you can match his. He's willing to slow down and walk at your pace until you can walk at his. That's a good God. There's an irony in this old story. Out of all the people on the earth, only one family is saved in the Noah story. A few centuries later, one family, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, will suffer loss so that all people on the earth can be saved. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Every man, woman, and child in this room can find grace there too. I'm going to ask uh, Scott Martin to come on up, and Scott's going to lead us in a prayer for our fathers. Can I have all the dads just stand right now? Dads, grandfathers, all you guys, foster fathers, everybody stand. And can we just give our, our dads a hand? Thank you for all you do. And if you guys will just remain standing, Scott's going to lead us in a prayer for dads. Will you pray with me? Our Father, create in each father and grandfather a deep sense of trust in you, knowing that he can count on you to help him lead and protect those dependent on him. Show him how effective the prayers of a godly man really are and what a difference he has and can make to those around him. Speak deep into the spirit and powerful words that they long to hear from you, that nothing can ever separate him from your love. Reward him for his faithfulness, past, present, and future, assuring him that true success and satisfaction do not lie in their accomplishments, but in the steadfast Christ-like character you're forming in him. Demonstrate to him your amazing grace and forgiveness as he seeks to love you and to know you with all of his heart, soul, and mind. Release him from the burdens of guilt. Teach him how to meet the needs of his child's life that are within his ability to do so. Help him to trust you for the rest. Push out any needless fears. Grant him godly wisdom, spiritual guidance, to lead and direct his children. Build in him a sense of joy, humility, and playfulness to draw his family close. Give him a passionate faith, a persevering spirit, and a powerful testimony that overcomes any weakness or doubt. Fill him with the best of your blessings so that one day he will stand before you and hear the ultimate words of praise. Well done, my son. Well done. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand. There we go. Mic on. Hey, happy Father's Day. I got a text from all of my boys this morning because they're all in Nashville at uh, Impact at Lipscomb University. Um, they all asked me what I wanted for Father's Day. I didn't have a good answer at the time. Um, if they were to ask me now, I would have a better answer. I would say I would like a pitch pipe with a lanyard so that I don't drop it in the middle of service ever again. <laughs> Poor Art had to read right through that. You didn't see this. He turned around and was like, Come on, man. Anyway, so sorry about that, Art. You did great. Thank you. Hey, these things as we close. Terrific Tuesday for all of our children's ministry, parents and kids. Dollar movie at Hollywood 18 at 10. Um, we've got a new member lunch coming up on the 25th. Even if you haven't placed membership but have been thinking about it or are interested in knowing more about our church, you are also invited to come. And uh, you can contact Steve Krigger. His contact information is right there. Uh, also, for all of our teens and children's ministry uh, folks and parents, Camp to Know Him registration, early bird reg registration is due today. So if you want the discount, make sure you get that money turned in um, today. Also, still looking for uh, volunteers for our Christian summer camp. There's a table set up downstairs. Um, Dinner and a Devo continues this Wednesday night. Is Steve Krieger in the house? Steve up here? It's Steve's favorite meal. 
Pot roast and mashed potatoes. So you want to be here Wednesday night. Steve will be leading the charge on the pot roast um, as soon as it's cooked. Um, you can get tickets outside in the lobby or call the church office by tomorrow. And don't forget, we're continuing to uh, seek new elder recommendations. Those forms are available in the lobbies. You can pick one up. Instructions are on that as to how that selection process will take place. Hey, again, happy Father's Day, and we hope to see you on Wednesday. Have a great rest of your week and day.